Namo tassa bhagavato rahato samma sambhutasa Namo tassa bhagavato rahato samma sambhutasa Namo tassa bhagavato rahato samma sambhutasa Uddang dhammang sangang namasami <coughs> so somebody's <coughs> talking to me to ask me about uh, checking out my views, opinions on Buddhist fundamentalism. So you have know, certain groups led led unfortunately by monks in Sri Lanka, kind of acts of violence against Muslims and Muslim shrines and encouraging people to fight uh, to protect Buddhism. Mm -hmm. And similarly, a movement in Burma doing much the same to protect Buddhism. And, you know, and you can, it's pretty... In some ways it's a rather mixed because you can understand people fear and uh, worry about losing their culture or getting overwhelmed or uh, Muslim attitudes towards their own fundamentalism. You know, everybody's got to convert to Islam or else. And so all this, uh, and yet it's essentially it's not acceptable. Buddhist monk is not. You just can't advocate violence. But you have to advocate the opposite. <laughs> so it's just not not it's just not tenable. And then there's a Thai gentleman there also getting a bit upset about Muslims in Thailand and we should fight them to protect Buddhism. Well if you fight them you've already lost Buddhism really. It's already gone. And it's useful in all these sort of confrontations and missions and setting things straight in the world to not try to say, what's the Buddhist attitude, but what's the Buddha's attitude? You look at the Buddha, his uncles in the Buddha's time, he didn't try to stop wars, no, he didn't set up a social welfare program, you know, didn't create equality, gender equality, didn't do that. You know, in some ways, a kind of bit of a wishy-washy <laughs> liberal, you know. But the point was, really, that, uh, you know, the Buddha said you need to gather all your energy, all your resources, all your intelligence, all your effort into doing the one thing that I am presenting this possibility of freeing your mind from greed, hatred, delusion, fear. Do that. That's what I'm presenting. Not trying to create a Buddhist country or a Buddhist state or a Buddhist society. Just do this. And of course the more people do it, if they find it beneficial, then naturally there's a certain growth and uh, communities develop and so forth. So the Buddha's aim was very much just saying, look, you know, you are in trouble. <laughs> Get, you know, focus on that, because that's what I can do something about. You know, the nature of nations and uh, national identities is something you can't do anything about. Except indirectly, through encouraging people to look into their fears, worries, tempers, irritations, and uh, encourage compassion, kindness, relinquishment, generosity, sharing. You know, you do that, then you essentially you're, you are working it out. Mm. It's always, as soon as you start to talk about Buddhism and Buddhists, you generally always get it wrong. Because <laughs> there aren't any Buddhist countries. <laughs> 
you know, the, what was what, a Buddhist country, you know, what's a Christian country, <laughs> you know. So we can say a Buddhist country like Thailand or Sri Lanka isn't exactly a model of virtue, there's sort of kinds of slavery and, uh, you know, prostitution, drug running, all this kind of thing. But then, yeah, yeah how much of a Christian country is do we have either, you know? You know, I have Christianity, 15th, 16th century, kind of slaughtered the entire, almost the entire population of South America <laughs> for the sake of God. <laughs> so, you know, and the great, when Europe was a leading power, then all the Christian countries are sending their crusades around the world and slaughtering everybody. So just these things don't add up. There's no such things as Christian countries or Buddhist countries. There's just people practicing Dhamma or not. And that's really, yeah, you know, it's not, not exactly comfortable. But this is what's being possible. This is what's being presented. Recognizing human species is a powerful and dangerous species. You know, if you're, you came from another planet and you landed on this, you came from Mars or somewhere, you landed on this planet, you look around and think, gee, these, these creatures, you've got to watch out for them. <laughs> There's always nothing they won't do. They're voracious, they take over everything. They've exterminated most of the rest of the species on the planet. They're killing, killing each other. This is an extremely dangerous uh, creature, this human thing. Beware. <laughs> so recognizing, you know, we're in this. Uh, what, what do you expect? So how to f- say, well, you didn't directly... Um, with the uh, source of it all. This is what we can do. We really can't make human beings into angels. So recognizing that, recognizing the world, human world, the social world is always going to be catastrophes are more or less inevitable. You know, is there ever a time when there isn't something catastrophic being generated just by human beings? let alone tsunamis and cyclones and hurricanes and so on. Is there ever a time when that human beings aren't cooking up some kind of disaster for each other? Recognizing this gives one the sense of some wega, like get a move on, you know, while you've still got some sense of peace and law and order and reasonable situation and reasonable body, don't hang around <laughs> Use it while you can to free yourself, because this is is not guaranteed, you know. And what is guaranteed is, in fact, our own death. So the Buddha is saying, "Well, you know, really, you know, put your energies into what you can accomplish." And sure, if you do that, I'm sure that you will generate goodness in the world. And there's a kind of, uh, one of the teachings he gave really shows you like almost three stages of that. Uh, What you put energy into, what you are keen for. So it's atapi is the word atapi. You have ardor, you're enthusiastic, you look for chances, you go, you go for it, you're eager for it, you're keen for it. And there's kind of stages of that. Like so often in the Buddha's teachings, he doesn't say it's just one thing, it's always a whole cluster of supportive conditions that tend towards growth. And he says, first of all, you've got to really put energy into and put Enthusiasm into finding good people. So the first stage is really almost taking refuge. Where do you get your nourishment from? Before you start solving other things, where do you put energy into finding good people? 
and associating with them. That means you're not just kind of hanging around, you really get there, you learn from them, you model, you question, you ask, you look into what they're doing, you know, you want to know what a good person is about, and you, you get to know them, you draw close. You said this is something you can't fault. Would anybody say find fault with that, whether they're Muslim, Jew, Buddhist, whatever, no, good people. Be with good people. Find good people. What's a good person? Someone you can trust. Somebody reliable. And, you know, generally, the again, pretty across the board, it's going to be certain moral standards. In Buddhism, you've got the five, essentially, refraining from killing, stealing, um, sexual misconduct. <coughs> false, harmful speech and intoxication. Basically all, all misconduct between people really amounts to um, treating other people as objects. Yeah. So you don't really get a sense of fellow feeling, subjectivity. This, just like me, is the, is the phrase you use. The, the mnemonic, the, mem- the device, you re- the thing you remember just like me, you know, <laughs> this person, you know, fears pain, enjoys pleasure, just like me, this person uh, doesn't want to be abused, doesn't want to be cheated, doesn't want to be lied to, just like me, this person doesn't want to be violated, attacked, just like me, you know. And you kind of have that in mind, it's very, you've got a moral compass there. They said, this is the kind of person you want to associate with, mm, someone who really keeps their eye on that, whether they're interesting, witty, intelligent, attractive, that's secondary to they keep their folk, their moral compass is steady. That's the person you want to be with. Mm. Because you're going to feel comfortable, you get some good advice, um, you'll grow, you'll learn, they'll be able to give you helpful feedback. And you'll sort of begin to, some of your own intuitions will be verified. You think, yeah, they, they, you see it being modelled. Goodness, skillfulness. And it encourages you to develop your own. Second thing we need to take in, really, you know, find ourselves uh, uh, Dhamma. So make an effort, make an, make an effort, be keen, be enthusiastic to hear some Dhamma, hear some, some teachings. Dhamma really means that which uh, gives this in balance, harmony. If you want to summarize it, creates harmony. There's no conflict. It sets things straight in yourself. You want to hear teachings, you want to hear teachings that give you practical advice on how to get your house in order. Mm. You make an effort to do that. And what you hear, you listen, try to summarise what's really being meant, what that, how that affects you, you weigh it up, you test it out, you check it out. Okay. And then the third thing arises is a quality of faith or confidence. Yes, this this is useful, this is good. You've got something that you can rely on both externally but also internally. You know your own sanity. You know your own steadiness. You know your own place where you feel sure and not pretending and not hoping and not trying to believe in something where you know something for sure. You have confidence. So these are the things we we look to to establish that, and, we, you know, and that's worth making an effort for. When you drink in that, when you abide in that, when you make an effort to to uh, uh, experience such things, then you start to realize there's, there's effort, there's energies you can put forward, and. Uh, First of these is called um, deep attention or wise consideration. 
is someone who reflects on things. What's the meaning of this? What's the purpose of this? What am I doing? Why do I do that? How's that going? How's this affecting me? And you're not just looking for verbal answers. You use this. You use what's called deep attention to really check in with your heart, with your basic ur- drives, urges, instincts, assumptions, um, attitudes. Where am I going? What, is that true or not? And uh, so this helps to clear, you know, what your aims and intentions, because you really begin to see that, you know, we're, we're very deluged with all kinds of signals and signs and information that's all about wrong assumptions. You know, like wealth makes you happy. Don't think so. Fame makes you happy. No, nope, that's what I like and make out. <laughs> These are good things. No, they're not. <laughs> they're not. They're not that great. Uh, you know, we have certain rights over other creatures. No, don't think so. Uh, we we can own things. Um, I don't think so. You know, you try and own something. How long for? That that you can achieve satisfaction through the senses check it out I don't think you're going to find that's the case so you start to look into these assumptions that are being kind of given to you all day long you know yeah because once you once you have confidence once you have you've got something you can you can know for sure then you're not just grasping at um, the propaganda of the consumer world, of the ideologies. You do, you don't, you're picky. You say, I don't want to buy something unless I really check it out, that it's worthwhile. And you've got something you can, you can test the world against. You know, there's the old anecdote, the parable of the person who's in some kind of simple villager is sitting on a sitting on a rock by the sea, just kind of fishing or something, just having relaxing time. And then somebody comes along and says, "Well, you know, you need to. You can get a job. You could learn. You could get a. You could work, and you could, re, you know, get da da da." He says, "What would happen then? Well, you'd have a house, and you'd have a car, and yeah, and you'd go out to work and get promoted. Yeah, okay." What was the purpose of that? Well, you've got a lot of money in the bank, and that means you could retire and just sit by the sea fishing. He said, well, that's what I'm doing already. (laughs) 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 You know, what was all that about? You know, (laughs) spin, isn't it? You know, you want to be happy, don't you? That's true, you want to be comfortable and happy, but does this stuff actually do it? You get so stressed out, uh, trying to find happiness. It's always just around the corner. A little bit harder, you get there. No, you don't. <laughs> you just, just run faster, that's all. <laughs> what you want. <laughs> yeah. So you really see what's essential, and uh, you try to, once you've established that sense of good friends, dhamma, confidence, then you've got something that you can check out. You can check things against. You've got some wisdom there. You've got some, some ground. And you don't lose that. You don't want to leave that. You don't want to act immorally in order to, you know, to follow these dreams. <clears throat> So you consider deeply and you look into these uh, moods and attitudes that we have and how many of them are really valid. So this means you start to develop um, mindfulness and clear comprehension, which is the next thing you do. That is, you bear something in mind. You bear an attitude, a 
train of thought, an emotion. <coughs> Bear it in mind, you stay with it. Where does that go? Where did it come from? Where does it take me? Hmm? And you, so you pause and you lengthen and wide, deepen your attention over the attitudes, trains of thought, uh, aims and goals. Where was it going? And so this is incredibly valuable because a lot of this stuff is never really fully followed through. You know? <coughs> so mindfulness, the ability to bear things in mind, stay with something, and that means you, obviously your body, but but developing it around your mental attitudes. What's that one? And not what it says, but what kind of mood is carrying it, and where where does it? As you, as you stay with that, you have clear comprehension as you witness that the process of that, where that feeling, where that thought, where, as it passes, as it moves along, what kind of mind state you're left with. Anxiety, urgency, panic, uh, got to get to the next thing, hurry up, you know, that, is that, that's where it gets you to? The next set of frustration, the next sets of ideas of something else I've got to do or get or be, you know, or find out or figure out. Well, it's going there, then why follow it? And this leads to what's uh, called um, restraint. As you really see how much of the the mind is, is like a runaway train. Or several, not just a runaway train, it's like trains going in different directions. <laughs> just running out, running out, uh, you know, from this to that, proliferating. Yeah. What about this? What about that? You know, and then it spins out, doesn't it? Sometimes when you, you know, you, so restraint means, uh, very important to get this sense of your being able to hold your energy, steady it, calm it. A thinking mind, how to steady it, calm it, slow it down. So you're not just you don't just hear something and spin out a whole narrative on it. You can hear something and mm-hmm, somebody says something disagreeable and you don't have to lash back. Something disappointing happens, you don't have to go into a whole victim state and proliferate around what's going to happen in the next five years you can, oh, this is disappointment this is hurt this is exciting this is that but you don't have to run out on it so restraint is, uh, is just a really important um, thing to cultivate for a human being just knowing what human beings are <laughs> what they do isn't it evident that some restraint is pretty much, if you're going to manage this thing, <laughs> this human condition, if you're going to try and manage it, then restraining has got to be a big part of it. There's nothing so mad as a human being. Yeah. There's nothing that creates so, much, so many fires as a human being. There's nothing that proliferates like a human being. So this is just being honest about the human condition. It's a it's an extremely potent, powerful. We've got powerful minds that can imagine the better, the worse, other people, the way things should be, could be, will be if I do this, won't be if I do that, and we can have that going more or less all the time. Till we barely know what's happening in the present moment because the mind is so running out into alternatives what it should be, what it will be, how I could be, what other people will think. And, yeah, but now, where are you? Now what's happening? That's what sense restraint means. You pull it back. This is agitation, isn't it? This is worry, isn't it? So you start to get some 
perspectives on what's really happening through restraint. This restraint is there to, to make one intelligent. It's not just the kind of locking yourself up. It's there to understand the roots of mental behavior. If you understand the roots, then you don't have to deal with the huge growth that comes out. You know, this is an unskillful root. Just pause on that one, don't feed that one. This is a skillful root. Let's let that one move steadily, sustaining mindfulness. Mm. So, restraint in this sense is not it's called a hair shirt thing. It's just in order to be intelligent and handle this human experience with all its huge energy. This is what one does kind of personally, individually. And we look and uh, you see that certainly the sequence of that is the more you live with good people, the more you live with people who are practicing restraint. It encourages one to practice restraint. The more you see the benefits of people whose minds are not running out of calm, composure, it encourages you to do the same. And you get confident, and you have confidence in that as being valid, beneficial, enjoyable, happy, rather than something that's some depriving you of fun and, and uh, possibilities. It's everyone to deepen more. So this is just really all set up for one's welfare. But naturally, you know, something like restraint has tremendous consequences for other creatures, isn't it? Because <clears throat> it feeds right into our actions. Mm. So the third set of instructions in this sequence deals with really, you know, what we bring forth. First, this is having cultivated restraint, then you can cultivate your interest that you know and you can encourage the good, good actions, speech, bodily actions, verbal actions, even emotions, even attitudes. Because with some restraint, instead of the mind being constantly a jungle of conflicting energies rushing out, you've started to prune that, check it, prune it, Take it back, you see. Oh, this is unnecessary. That one's just worry. That's could be, but doesn't is not relevant now. This is the good. And then you put energy into bringing forth the good. You know. Then you cultivate it. So, I mean, to me, sometimes it amounts to things like going in a car or a plane somewhere, you know. And I could, uh, you know, have a chat, somebody about something like that. You don't really want to talk to people who are driving on anything too important because you want them to focus on the road. So I always think conversations in cars are not such a good idea, (laughs) minimal. (laughs) But then... You know, or you could sit on the plane kind of reading the kind of very lightweight literature they literature or magazines they produce or videos. <laughs> or you can just think, No, I don't oh, no, why not go switch that off, switch that off, put that away. We're just here practice loving kindness instead. <laughs> you know, just think of people I know and wish them well. People I Live, dead, near, far. May they be well. Experience gratitude for them, uh, forgiveness for them, uh, goodwill towards them. I mean, oh, I want to spend an hour doing that. I'll probably feel a lot better than doing Sudoku cross or crosswords on the, on some magazine. It's not that these are immoral. It's just like how much time do we we waste. How much time is just 
you know just killing it, killing time and if you're if you eager you see this is a possibility even when you're not physically doing anything or saying anything, you can still generate goodwill <laughs> wise reflection you can still do that uh, and then where does that take you? you feel hmm? probably a good place I would think check it out <clears throat> good actions are said to lead to or support or nourish the four foundations of mindfulness. <clears throat> so, this may, we just talked about mindfulness, but this means just being aware, being, bringing to mind, or focusing, sustaining your attention on just what's happening in your day, in your thoughts, in your emotions, in your mind, you know, and clearly understanding it. The four foundations is something much more uh, focused which is nourished by good actions. Because with good actions you're starting to take a very little more hands-on, conscious, decisive decision about what you're going to do with your mind. Yeah. Yeah. And more, more closely focused. And that becomes possible because now your mind is trained. You've restrained it. You've fed it. You've encouraged it. You've given it something to have confidence in, and it becomes something that now, you, now it becomes much more willing and capably and trained. So then you start to do like the four foundations mean you're referring to what's happening in your body and other people's body, what's happening in terms of feeling and other people's feeling, what's happening in terms of mind states other people's mind states what's inter- happening in terms of skillful processes or unskillful processes the same with other people as you do this you begin to recognize you know basically there are these once you <coughs> the sense of self and other is less of a dominant concern. Mm. Because now you're contemplating, you're attentive to, this is somebody else getting upset. This is me getting upset. What happens to that? This is the phenomenon, the mind state of being upset. It's like this. One is no longer so shocked by other people getting upset nor so righteous about oneself getting upset. <laughs> you know, somebody else is getting riled up and angry and think, oh, yeah, anger. Uh-huh, I know that one. When I get riled up and angry, it's right and true. When somebody else gets riled up and angry, they're obnoxious and difficult and stupid. No, they're just angry. Just like I'm angry. So this kind of judgment and them, us, the bias of them and us begins to dissolve and you get something more like a sense of compassion and concern and appreciation of the good. This person's experiencing happiness and well-being. Good. I know what that's like. Good. May they stay with that. This person's... uh, you know, doing something skillful and courageous. Good, good. Rather than, I'm not as good as he is. <laughs> you know, which is what happens when we create this self and other boundary, right? You're contemplating mind states as mind states, internally, externally. Mm-hmm. Bodies as bodies. You know, you see other people's bodies moving around, you think. You know, you can think, well, she's really attractive. Or you, think, or you just think, well, that one hurts too, doesn't it? <laughs> like this one does. 
that one also gets grubby and has to be clean, like this one does. That one gets hungry, like this one does. <laughs> that one gets tired and needs to lie down, like this one does. Instead of, you know, just that which separates us and makes us envious or attracted or, or re, re, you know, repelled by other people's bodies or whatever, you get a sense of, yeah, just like, yeah, that's a body. And you're not deluded by it. You're not deceived by it. <clears throat> I think there's a really, you know, bodies are such big things because people, so much can be made out of them, and particularly, you know, the, the amount of stuff that's heaped on, I suppose, all bodies, female bodies. I think it was really interesting some time back, some somebody, some model or something, actually demonstrated what it took to get what it, how, how long and what, what, it, what she had to do to get her body into that, that thing that you see on a magazine and like it took her hours of work just kind of hoisting it and toning it and primping it and doing stuff to it to get it into this, this image that they could put on a cover and they still they'd sort of airbrush bits and you know scoop bits out they didn't like you know and she was demonstrating just and this is like last for about you know maybe five years before it's difficult to even one more what you do it to it it's not really going to get there anymore <laughs> it's not going to hit the high spots anymore after it's about 32 or 33 that's the end of that you know <laughs> it's going to take much more effort to try and achieve this particular image and you think, gee, you know, the amount of suffering and pain that goes on in trying to do that alone. And how well, helpful it is to see, there's a body, the knees hurt, don't they? <laughs> there's a body, the back, back gets twinges, doesn't it? There's a body, you know, and it gets hot and cold. You think it's a lot more just like this. So in mindfulness, you're really... In those four foundations, you're looking at the particular mind states, you know, really beginning to use that to to dissolve or, you know, at least soften the self boundary. Just that, you know, we do that. Isn't this a big thing to do that would help in conflict with other people? If we're starting to soften that self other boundary, isn't that conducive to harmony, sharing, compassion to others? Whatever their label is, whether we feel whether they look pleasant or ugly or speak our language or don't speak our language or strange customs or whatever, you know. So this is uh, then it's really putting effort into into doing just that, you know, in yourself. This is a body. Forget the dreams and the images, the assumptions. This this body you can know in yourself. There's nothing wrong with it. It's exactly like every other body, essentially. When you look at another person's body and you see the same thing. And then you cultivate like that, you begin to look into perceptions, feeling mind states. This is another person's anxiety there's the anxiety experience there's the trying to get it right experience there's the aspirations and uncertainties there's the beautiful there's the afflicted just like here and with mindfulness and clear and the establishing like that we're able to recognize it rises it passes it's not self this is a tremendous uh, 
boon, you know, that one, to realize this. This is how the Buddha was able to talk to murderers, you know, parasites, kings, a whole lot, right down to them, because they're just another being, body, their karma, their mental activities, just that's what's happening. And you point to that. So this is, you know, when you do that, you're putting energy into cultivating wisdom, calm, investigation, and equanimity. In fact, called the seven factors of enlightenment, which we won't go into the whole lot, but really they amount to uh, wisdom, calm, and uh, freedom. You can experience this for yourself. And in such a realization, this is, this is, this is what Buddhists are supposed to be doing. <laughs> you know, it's not about, you know, going to the monastery or going to Buddhist ceremonies or these kinds of things. This is what Buddhists are supposed to be doing, cultivating this. You know, so they even forget that they're Buddhists, they're just people. And this is where the conflict, this is the source of removing one's own conflict and removing conflict in the world. And this is just, just what we're practicing, you know. How many of us take our mind states as so final, such a weight, such a curse, such a wonderful thing, such a terrible thing, such a fascinating thing. <laughs> you know, a mind state is a mind state. And you recognize anything. I so say this, people have so a lot of guilt and regret about their mind states. There's something wrong with me. But just bear in mind, if you can name that mind state, and most of them are very simple words, that you know those words. Right? This is fear, this is jealousy, this is rage. They're extremely simple words because everybody uses them, because everybody has them. If there wasn't a word for it, <laughs> yeah, and because it'd be, it would be yours. But because there's a word for it, it means that it's very common. <laughs> There's nothing self about it. It's common currency. <laughs> yeah. So if you can name it, you know, you're pretty sure that everybody's got it. <laughs> it's the same. It's the virus of the human condition. Yeah. So we don't really want to take a stand on, on humanity as being the, something that's so, so uh, you know, should be so blessed. Humanity is a very mixed thing. And from this mixture of potentials, the beauty is we can, through this cultivation, you can begin to, you know, mold and channel and direct and purify. This is what the Buddha is encouraging us to do. It takes everything we have to do that. And uh, if we're practicing Dharma, this must be our focus. Anyone?